but um thank you so much guys for um finding time to kind of hop in our first webinar it's really my pleasure to host it and uh yeah so we started our series that's gonna call uh vlogbox get together so my name is Anna McMichael. Um, I'm Director of Strategic Partnership at Vlogbox. And I have about seven years of experience um, in SaaS and uh, ad tech uh, industries and work as an advisor um, for diverse tech projects. So a little bit about Vlogbox. So what we really do, um, we kind of unite um, animation studios, content creators, vlog, uh, vloggers, advertising agencies under, under the same roof and umbrella, and also showing them the options how to get into the space and how to have your safe monetization in place, and monetization in place. So um, I would love to um, introduce our speakers today. Uh, it's Aaron Bindish, he's the Director of Advertising and Digital Media Rates. Um, so one of the world's largest content aggregators. Um, and Dean Valentin, uh, CEO at b &E. mm, Studio put in fun and healthy, uh, you know, content for, from the best uh, minds that was in the children television. He's also a former president of Disney Television and founder of Comedy.com. So the reason why we actually started our uh, series is because we want to show that those really complicated things, it seems like complicated things, if you want to start your channel or explore different opportunities on CTV, uh, can be really, really simple to understand. And uh, that's why we really invited best minds in this industry to kind of clear a couple things for us. So uh, let, let me go over the agenda. So let's kind of go um, and have a discussion for about 15 minutes. And then at the end of the webinar, we can have about 10 minutes for questions and comments. Does it sound good? Okay, take it as, as a yes. <laughs> so we are also recording this webinar and you guys will be able to watch it um, if, uh, later. Okay, so I think until uh, if we, you know, Without further ado, let's get to it. And I kind of want to start with general um, understanding of our OTT landscape at this point. So we know that really until recently, um, YouTube was the only one solid monetization platform for video creators. Now we have a lot of things in place, like uh, Google decided to cut ad spends. There is a lot of terms and conditions updates. And this is one of the reasons why CTV is so popular as well. Uh, so there is really, really many opportunities for people who just want to have their channel from scratch. Uh, there were so many options to monetize. So there is a lot of opportunities, really. It's like a new space in, the, in this matter. So, uh, Aaron, you are familiar with YouTube demonstration phenomenon, right? Could you share some, some of your feedback on that matter? What do you think, why people go on CTV? And maybe you can share also some metrics, uh, maybe engagement rates, just to kind of show us uh, why this is so possible to do and why people are really tend to kind of join the CTV space. Yeah, well, for, um, for some context, uh, digital media rights uh, mm -hmm. aggregates and licenses content from uh, film, film studios and other sort of midpoint distributors around the world. And we take, we take that content and uh, publish it on our branded OTT channels across the CTV space and other OTT type uh, settings, including mobile, mobile web, and desktop web, as well as uh, we, we do clip publishing for monetization purposes, as well as for promotional purposes on social media platforms like YouTube, uh, Facebook, etc. cetera. Um, so, the um, CTV, of course, is a is a very quickly growing uh, and very broad subset of the greater video distribution uh, space. And um, I mean, there's <laughs> there's sort there's many different sort of sides to why people choose that that space. Um, for one, the number of platforms 
that are you know considered uh, part of the CTV space is growing constantly um, w with more and more households having smart televisions, having uh, set-top box devices mm -hmm. uh, with their televisions. Uh, people are cord cutting, getting rid of their cable services, and it pr presents an opportunity for digital distribution options that are just substantially uh, different and in a lot of ways more accessible than the traditional cable cable setups and platforms. Um, mm -hmm. So I think in your question there were, there was a couple of things like why why uh, why people are turning from social media platforms perhaps like YouTube into a plat more uh, almost a television distribution platforms like CTV. Uh, um, but it's you know it, it's coming from both directions I'd say coming from the traditional television distribution model from the traditional uh, theatrical cinema mm -hmm. distribution model and from the other side um, and I'd say that that uh, that sort of two-sided aspect it's 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 funneling funneling into the um, home entertainment the uh, broad connected device world. And uh, the pandemic also, you know, it changes the way that people consume the amount that they're connected to their devices, the number of devices that they're connected to at any given time. Uh, and monetization is, of course, excellent yeah. on CTV. As compared to mobile devices, as compared to, to web and mobile web, you just, you get more, more for your buck. Uh, if you want to promote something on those platforms, you get a much greater return on, on your on your investment uh, mm -hmm. so there's there's ma many many sides to it I'd say yeah do you see any spikes on um, uh, let's say installs rates views for the past let's say year or six months well especially with pandemic oh, absolutely uh, and it's it, sometimes it's hard to separate those things from the growth mm -hmm. of our brands and the growth of our distribution so um, there, uh, there's some sort of correlation there, and our brands are growing with the increase in home uh, media viewership. They're also mm -hmm. growing with the increase of our distribution. We're, we're hitting more platforms. We're putting more money into into marketing. We're utilizing more native marketing that, that we're not paying for. And there's a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of different things that lead to our growth. But <laughs> you know, so on one hand, yes, digital media rights and our brands are growing substantially over time. There are certain metrics that I can correlate more directly to uh, pandemic type changes. Uh, people's engage the you know higher viewership rates per uh, install. Let's say that is probably because people are leaving the house less. Um, there's a uh, you know uh, certain spending habits on the demand side where. Um, CTV advertising budgets were low for the first half of 2020. And then when things started to get better, when consumer goods could be uh, advertised and hawked more, we, we ended up with a, a substantial, substantial increase in spend and CPMs from that side of things, from the demand side. So that's another sort of pandemic era uh, metric that improves the, the value proposition for us to invest in our CTV distribution. Yeah, yeah, that makes, yeah, that makes total sense. I, I wonder how it's going to happen, what's going to happen once um, pandemic will completely will go away. I don't know if that's the case in the nearest future, but like this type of environment, if it's going to increase or are we going to kind of hit the plateau? So that's going to be interesting thing to kind of watch. Uh, in the nearest future. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Dean, I have a question for you. As uh, I'm sure there was at some point, it was a decision um, and kind of like you had an option to compare the platforms where you would host your content at. Uh, what is the best one for reaching the audience on your opinion? And now I'm talking about not really only CTV, but also uh, YouTube, Roku, Samsung TV, like all of those platforms. Which one is the best for reaching the audience on your opinion? Well, we, uh, I guess we, we, 
we're attracted to CTV and there's a reason we're there. Um, you know, I think it was the, I, I come out of the traditional television business. I, I was a, you know, that, that ran Disney television. I ran Disney kids TV and, you know, I've always found that it was sort of very attractive way of reaching an audience. Um, and, you know, I never, uh, uh, the, the, the combination of, um, uh, the immediacy of traditional television uh, combined mm -hmm. with the customization and interactivity of the digital uh, of digital technology really seemed like a perfect uh, combination for us. Um, and you know, for for um, uh, you know the kids the kids business in particular, which is what I'm interested in, is how to reach children is undergoing really radical shift. A lot of the things we're seeing. Uh, in, in the general marketplace is really um, uh, distilled uh, and, and uh, uh, turbocharged in the kids' marketplace, which is children are leaving the traditional traditional media. We're not, you know, there was just recently a story in uh, the Wall Street Journal about how they're not, you know, the, the, what used to be the sort of the family movies and the movie theaters are really no longer performing, you know, and, and because the kids are moving into the, the content is moving into the home. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, Disney channel, uh, you know, the, the cable channels are sort of fragmenting and, and, uh, losing audience. So where, where's all this audience going? What are kids doing? Well, you know, obviously they're going on YouTube, they're going into digital platforms and, um, you know, they're native, it, it, they're really native to it at this point. And so that's really where we want it to be. And, you know, for us, uh, you know, the opportunity to reach, uh, you know, Roku, I think has 40 million uh, subscribers at this point, or something close to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Not to mention, you know, Samsung and Vizio and all the other, you know, players in the marketplace. The opportunity to to reach all those with a with an app was just uh, uh, really appealing, and that's what we that's why we embarked on this. And and we've seen just in the we're, we're still a very new company. In fact, we still basically consider us, ourselves in beta. Uh, but even in the you know few months that we've been active, we've seen tremendous growth in the marketplace. Um, you know, new entrants, new, new kinds of content, uh, uh, you know, uh, just uh, ratings growth. So we're very, uh, we're very excited at the prospect of uh, uh, planting our flag here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since you mentioned the uh, linear TV, kind of wanted like to have a general, to ask you a general question. So when it comes to linear TV and CTV, what would you see as benefits and disadvantages? For both, I would say. Well, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting. Linear, because one of the things we're one of the areas that I think we're looking at doing something a little bit different is mm -hmm. uh, our, our ultimate. Uh, you know, our ultimate goal is to create a sense of a clubhouse for kids um, and a sort of a safe place, a place where you can feel a sense of community with other kids and not just sort of click on a click on a video that you're watching and then click on another video and click on another video, but to feel part of a moment and other kids and, and, um, you know, back when I was, and this is a long time ago, so you'll forgive me, but back, back in the day, there were, there were shows like Romper Room and Barney and all that. And they, they, they did an incredible job of making kids feel like they were part of something. And so we were, we're sort of st starting to do that and you know, we're casting now. So we're going to have a live linear, you know, the live stream show that's going to be going on for, you know, four to eight hours a day, that is exactly that. And um, so any kid can tune in, not only access content that's, that's part of our library and that we license from other players like Patel and whoever else, but can also sit there and just watch other kids playing uh, and have a teacher and do something educational. Um, so, you know, it's the, again, it's the immediacy and the sense of connectedness that I think really is the core of what, uh, uh, you know, uh, television can provide yeah i feel like the landscape like when it comes to kids especially like it's going to change so much in the nearest future because there is so much more to cover there's so much more to do and there's so much more opportunities to make it like you said engage like where kids can engage when they stay connected and not just click from show to show so that's thank you so much for that um answer it's really really helpful um, another thing that I wanted to cover is, uh, as obviously now when we go to any of these platforms, we can see a huge breakdown when it comes to categories, right? 
we have thousands of content subjects. It's gaming, cooking, um, entertainment is obviously number one, it's still the winner. However, um, yeah, we'd also see spikes on kids' content, obviously. But then still, there is so much more um, to come and there is so many different categories that are up and coming. So, uh, Aaron, question to you. What's your feedback on categories on CTV? Like, did you notice any patterns and why certain patterns go in certain ways? Um, well... Yes, first and foremost, I agree there's a lot of sort of specialization in mm -hmm. applications targeting. And um, to some extent, it's necessary to to find your sort of niche that you're filling and, and uh, attract attention based on a particular interest category. It's sort of the nature of, the, of this internet era is that people are looking for something that fits their... Um, their their interest and pe there's yeah like you're saying specific interests that people have um there's also the plat so big streaming platforms like netflix and, and the like are sort of a feedback loop where where they are producing a lot of content that fits um these niches these categories that people are interested in like true crime is huge right now and uh uh, mm -hmm. anime and uh, all all of these and um you know k-pop is is growing so the the way that um we're we're sort of tackling that at digital media rights is categorizing our licensed content into different brands developing new brands that are based um you know in these content categories so we have an anime channel we have a korean pop culture channel we have we're, we're, we just launched a uh linear feed actually f mm -hmm. for uh True crime and paranormal, uh, and uh, sort sort of to call back to that linear conversation. These uh, uh, the, as more and more apps are launching that host multiple linear feeds, we see that on our side as an opportunity to have linear feeds that address different content niches. So you end up with these video applications that are in and of themselves free. Uh, multi-channel platforms, uh, virtual MVPDs, uh, and uh, <laughs> it, and through that, you're ending up with uh, a, a a market within a market almost, where your 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 right. user's attention is split between the different content niches. So our uh, digital media rights has a uh, general entertainment application called Cinehouse, which is expanding it's a uh, linear footprint and uh, mm -hmm. taking tape we're, we're we're putting in additional feeds that cover subsets of the content um just like most vod applications will have different genre sections so it's there you know it's the it's the nature of this connected device era where people want to click into their to their interest category and to your question, what emerges is a sense of what people are interested in. It influences, at least at Digital Media Rights, it influences our content acquisition and partnership approach. And it's the, it's the sort of ongoing feedback loop that determines what content we surface, what content we use in our promotional materials, what we use in our social media, which is monetized separately through the social media platforms monetization mm -hmm. setups. We also have to be sensitive to our advertisers' needs for brand safety, but also their interests for uh, particular stunts or, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be working with some, uh, a buyer who wants a specific title or a specific genre category. Uh, so content categorization and application level categorization definitely it cuts uh, it, it it impacts the the business on all levels from channel development brand development all the way down to uh impression level advertising targeting and, and budget allocation mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I, I agree with you um, 100%. Uh, Dean, what's, what do you think about categorization of the content? What's your feedback on that? Do you have any 
recommendations maybe or any just like what you what you've been experiencing well, uh, I, even I, I know yeah. I, I agree i think i think you know i think we're headed i think there's no question that we're headed for uh increasing categorization and niche mm-hmm. content creation um I, I mean part of this just sort of the the if you look sort of at the uh play tectonics of the of the media universe it's really been a uh you know, the story has really been one of increasing viewer choice. You know, it, it started with like three networks and you could watch only those three networks. And if you didn't have any of it, if you didn't like it too bad, you know, that's what you were, you were a captive audience. And then, you know, there were like 10 cable channels and a hundred cable channels and, you know, then digital came along. And so now we're, we're into the, you know, we're into the ultimate next phase, final phase. I mean, actually, I don't know if it's final. I'm sure there'll be many, many more developments, yeah. but you know, we're, we're certainly at a, we're certainly at an inflection point where I think we're going to see uh, uh, another expansion of viewer choice, particularly in the CTV area. I mean, I can, you know, when I, when I turn on one, you know, when I turn on Pluto TV or, or, or Tubi or if like it, there's, there's still a radical lack of choice for, for people. And you can just see all the various, uh, opportunities that there are for somebody who would fill that just, you know, the magazine business went through an exactly the same, uh, which no longer exists, but it went through exactly the same thing. It went from broad, you know, broad general interest magazines. And, you know, by the end there was, you know, you know, there were magazines dedicated to scooters and to, you know, you know, uh, surfing and, and, you know, it's going to be, that's certainly the way the, the, this, this ecosystem is going to uh, uh, develop as well, both for, but for advertisers and for, uh, and for consumers, uh, they both want that ability to target and to specialize and to, uh, to reach people's, uh, you know, what we're really talking about, cause I always believe in looking at the emotional underlayer of what's going on in the technology. People are passionate about certain things and they want, they want to have access to the things that they're passionate about and advertisers want to be able to reach those people who are passionate about their interests. That's why they're mm-hmm. willing to pay higher CPMs for that. Um, and, you know, that's really where, um, that's sort of where I see the, 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 uh, the whole thing developing. We're, lo- we're, we're certainly looking at that beyond the children's business as well. Mm. Yeah. So basically the whole categorization will get even more granular. Uh, you think? I think, I think yeah. so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And, I, and to, to the good, I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's good for everybody, right? Starting from advertisers to content owners. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, I also noticed that gaming is really, really up and coming. And uh, I think it's going to it's gonna blow um, even more. Like now, Netflix already tested their first game on the platform. And then Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and Joy TV they already have a dedicated app stores. So yes, it, obviously it gets even more granular on a gaming side, but I just kind of thought that um, gaming as a overall is just something that up and coming. Do you think, do you think so too? Well, this, I mean, just judging by, just judging by my 19 year old son's behavior. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, I think there's no, I think there's no question that it's uh it's one of the main modes of media interaction for this next for the next generation of uh, uh, of, of kids. Uh, oh yeah, or, or young. Yeah, Aaron. Or whatever. Aaron, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's you know the 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 industry where they're actually selling the video games is one thing, and the consoles which they're which they're played on, and then the the added layer of the huge growing industry of people watching other people play games, uh, watching them play them competitively watching individual personalities who, you know, uh, on social media who are playing the mm-hmm. games. It's a growing thing in the OTT space. It's sort of, it's, it's trickling in. We, uh, Digital Media Rights is actually going to launch a, a, a linear channel that's uh, eSports. That th- this is, uh, you know, it's, it's huge. On, on, the other so- on the other side of it, the consoles have OTT. I mean, the consoles pretty much function as set-top boxes themselves. Yeah, so exactly. It's, so it's uh, it's becoming increasing. Even though the options are growing, it's becoming sort of circular. I mean, people are watching other people play video games on their video game consoles, using their consoles just as a video player, not even for the interactive component. Um, so it's 
th this is that that idea of, of uh, a lot of technologies converging on these video game devices, I, I think. And uh, the, uh, the intellectual property of the games themselves, you know, they, the, the game studios have to uh, like have to approve of the the uh, who hosts the, uh, the the gameplay. It's a uh, it's an increasingly complicated uh, complicated thing going on. And live streaming platforms like Twitch, which operate uh, largely on people playing video games, are mm -hmm. uh, growing and taking up more and more of young people's attention. Uh, so it's definitely is one of the biggest growing content categories, no, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. So another thing I wanted to kind of touch base on is uh, we all know that basically like the big four universal players in CTV is Roku, Fire TV, Apple TV, and Android. Uh, and also on, on the top of that, we have another variety of um, monetization models, which is subscription-based, advertising-based, and uh, transaction-based. Uh, Dean, what was your strategy on picking the platform and uh, picking on monetization models? Uh, and what platforms generally you consider the most promising? Well, you know, for, for we thought the SVOD um, uh, platform was uh, impossible to First of all, it was very advanced. It was impossible to penetrate. Uh, it was really occupied by very large media companies, like the ones I used to work for. Um, <laughs> and and um, and it also felt like it was sort of starting to reach uh, some sort of point where it was uh, not going to keep developing. It's just, you know, there's only so much money that any human mm -hmm. being can afford to, you know, right. spend on media. And and, you know, I can see why I would want Disney TV, but it would be very difficult for a new player to really, really make a compelling, with, with limited library, to make a really, really compelling case. So a, a, um, AVOD really seemed like the place we wanted to be, that we could reach advertise, we could still reach advertisers and make a compelling case for what we were doing uh, mm -hmm. and reach an audience. Um, and the barrier to entry was uh, uh, much lower um, for, for our business. Um, and so we chose, when thinking about it, we, we chose, that's what we chose and that's what we decided to do. And we, we built, we built our app and, you know, we decided to, uh, you know, we decided on the Roku platform because it was really the largest, it was the largest one. Uh, it was very, you know, it was having a lot of, um, uh, success reaching children with some of the content that was already there that we, that we could see. Um, and so it just seemed, it seemed like a natural, it seemed like a natural for us. Mm -hmm. So Roku was your number one. And then uh, what is the strategy on the rest of the platforms? Well, we're going to, you know, we're slowly building out to as we as we grow and as we, we you know, we want to we, we'd had a, um, you know, without going into it at great length, you know, we'd had a fairly difficult uh, birth with, a, uh, with, with another company, uh, you know, we had a really bad experience with the technology, it didn't work, you know, we lost about a year um, uh, of development. Uh, and so we're very, very sensitive to making sure that what we present is works great, looks great, feels great. Um, and can, you know, and has, uh, uh, uh all the things in place that we need to grow. Um, and so that's why we kind of have a very extended beta of like two or three years. So, um, no, I mean, really two or three months, sorry. Uh, and you know, so that, that, um, uh, that's really what we're doing. So we're, we started with Roku. We're about to launch on um, uh, Samsung and Vizio. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think when, once we're done with that and we feel that those are, you know, working, looking great. And then, uh, then I think we're uh, going to do uh, fire and uh, Apple. Um, and, uh, um, and then I think, well, you know, th that feels like a fairly full, that feels like a fairly full hand at that point. Um, mm -hmm. But Roku is, you know, we, we really just started, I mean, literally it was like a couple of months ago. So we just started feeling really secure about what we're doing and we're starting to see audience growth. And so uh, we're feeling good about where we mm -hmm. are. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, also, like we know that a lot of uh, kind of like newer content owners and content creators, creators going to watch the webinar. So um, there is a lot of opportunities and really with CTV where you can launch your channel without 
really a tech team, right? So there is like uh, Roku Direct Publisher where you with minimum technical knowledge, you can launch your channel. Even though if you really want to have a, you know, big growth, you need to have access to your code. And it's a lot better to really have either your own technical team or kind of uh, pass it to maybe freelancers or third parties. Um, anyways, Aaron, maybe some guides and tips on how to create channels on Roku and Amazon, uh, what is the fastest way and, you know, on the way of creating apps, any challenges that you face, any recommendations on that matter? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of ways into it. I think your points about how development works and, you know, who to have develop is a, you know, important question. Um, it takes, uh, it definitely takes uh, a very either a solid established app development setup, the, mm -hmm. the self-publishing options that, uh, that platforms like Roku provide or um, a, a, uh, a lot of tr trial and error and probably, probably both the trial and error comes in with a sort of d development option as well. Um, plenty of people manage with the self-publishing option but uh, it depends on the content you're pushing. It depends on the branding you set up. I think branding is key. If you have if you have the capital for it, uh, using in-platform marketing tools, and paying for some placement and uh, high in the search or uh, on the home pages, etc., is really important for developing an OTT brand. Digital media rights has done a lot with social media. It's not for everyone. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of creative effort. You know, we have the benefit of having in-house creative team, the same mm -hmm. folks who, the same folks who are making the individual movie posters for our content, are making the branding for our channels, are making the promotional materials that we're using for uh, B two C marketing, and the B two B promotional materials as well. So we've got a tight design, graphic design team that's that's uh, handling a lot of the. Uh, sort of the cre the creative visual creative aspect of it, and it's helped us immensely with our growth. Um, th there's so much at play, really, in 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 launching an OTT channel. It takes time and patience, and having a solid base of of, of content to work with, a substantial enough base of content to push into the um, to the space is, is is also very important. You know, we ha we've been established in publishing an OTT for for uh, more than five years now. But uh, we still launch new brands. We launch new applications fairly regularly, and we can only do that with a strong enough base of content and very well vetted uh, branding and uh, promotional materials. And even then, it's a challenge and takes uh, takes organic marketing. It takes paid marketing. There's really a, a lot at play. And back to the point about business model, uh, you can't just jump in and say this is a everything's behind a paywall uh you've never heard of this brand before but somehow you're going to spend five dollars a month uh to to you to to access the content it's just not going to happen uh yeah at, at the same time if you're doing it for free and all your advertisements are for uh, like cell phone games or something and or 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 like gambling it's, you're not necessarily going to attract an audience uh, also if they're being annoyed relentlessly with repetitive advertisements. Um, it happens all the time. It's against the terms for a lot of the platforms, but people do it anyway. I'm sure you've all experienced it if you've, if you've, used, uh, if you've used any advertising supported streaming. It's uh, um, that you, you have to make sure that the user experience is worth the user's time. And uh, it, that, that's that's not not the easiest not the easiest thing to do so there's a mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a huge and growing marketplace so a lot of people are trying it out a lot of the marketplace is owned or you, like you know companies like digital media rights own you know we have seven per, seven or so uh, apps in these marketplaces other companies will have dozens and you'll, you'll click into multiple applications and see the same content, uh, only slightly different branding. So it's, it's, it's very saturated, but there's, uh, there, there are a lot of different ways in, I'd say. 
Yeah. And speaking of those who are just trying it out, right? If we just going to touch base on a development and like step number one, uh, would you recommend to play with like, you know, tools that you can automatically develop your app or you would recommend to start, you know, using someone else to build a strong base as a channel itself? Like yeah. companies, right? Who would take care of a development and launch perfect app and then... Um. Oh, go ahead. Um, oh, oh, you you can go first, Dean. Um, uh, you know, I, I can I I can only speak from our experience, which was uh that it was yeah, much, much that it was much much better to hire a company that uh specialized in it and was good at it. Um, we were very we as I said, we had a bad experience uh with one company that uh um you know didn't deliver what we thought they would. Um. Mm -hmm. And then we were lucky. I, I, you know, I feel no hesitation mentioning their name. We we work with Float Left, uh, which built a, a fantastic app for us, and the experience has been great. Uh, I don't think we 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 were not neither we didn't have the knowledge or the ability uh, to do it on our own. And it would have, as as Aaron said, you know, if you're really trying to build a brand, you really need to own your technology in the end. I mean, you can't yeah, exactly. You can't. You can't. You can't you can't let it, you know, you need the flexibility of how to reach people and, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so you need to own the code and, and, you know, that, that's sort of a bottom line issue. And so, yeah, if you're just doing something for, you know, you know, if it's one of 50 things you're doing and you don't really care and, you know, um, you just want to get it out there, that's fine. But if you're really, you know, if you're really looking at a long-term brand building um, uh, exercise, which I think is what you have to be in the media world today, because uh, how you're going to stand out from, this vast, you know, sea of content that's pouring out into people's devices every day. Um, and so if you're going to build a brand, you really need to own the technology. And, and for that, I think you need a company that, uh, unless you are one, uh, you need a company that really knows what they're, uh, how to build it, what to do it. So I would highly recommend, uh, mm -hmm. uh, doing that. uh, you know, we found, we found it to be a really happy and professional experience uh, with uh, float left. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, guys. Um, kind of want to go back to, uh, you know, one of the topic of uh, monetization methods. So AVOD, SVOD, uh, I feel like everyone keep talking about this and I agree with you. AVOD is kind of like the, the, to uh, the, the monetization method that a lot of newer content owners and content creators are choosing because there's so much money you can spend on subscriptions every month and it's not it's probably not going to hit more than 70 dollars if we're talking about like north america i i read it in the article where they had the statistics where like there was only like from 70 to 100 dollars that people are willing to spend on entertainment and that's probably about it so are you really going to hit that? Is your content is really going to be in this, you know, frame, or you probably would just going to go with Avon in the meantime? Um, also, from what I saw, that uh, Apple TV, yes, like here maybe it's better to build a SWOT, uh app because Apple users tend to pay better for, you know, tend to pay actually for the subscriptions. So uh, Dean kind of wanted to know your opinion on that. And also uh, whenever it comes, yeah, you, you chose AVOD, but then how do you guys access analytics, reporting, uh, mean, maybe marketing support? How do you get the data to analyze uh, that that was the best strategy? And well, any, any input on that? Well, I would say just generally, um, you know, we, we want to be, if the kid and the kids, the kids business because of all the changes it's going through, it's really become AVOD is a solution, not only for us or, or for, mm -hmm. for viewers, it's a solution for advertisers. You know, the, 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 the S you know, kids advertisers can no longer really reach kids effectively on traditional platforms where they used to be able to reach them. You know, it just doesn't, you know, Saturday morning television or, or cable TV or, or, afternoon you know afternoon blocks on tv stations all those not none of those exist anymore but you know fundamentally mm -hmm. and and so it's a crisis for advertising how do i reach you know if, if i have an ad that would be you know i mean the, but by the way a whole separate question is what's appropriate advertising for children and how do we you know filter yeah, out the stuff time. that's not but uh mm -hmm. but just you know if, if ads for the children's marketplace 
are, uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult, difficult for them. So uh, AVOD really provides a solution for that. And, and that's why for the kids marketplace, especially AVOD is the, is the right, you know, is the right solution. Um, uh, so, um, you know, in, in terms of analytics, we have, you know, we, we get analytics from, you know, we have our own analytics, we get from Google analytics, we have like endless, you know, we get them from Roku, we have endless analytics pouring in, um, you mm -hmm. know, they're not really, they're only marginally relevant at this point, because we're such an early stage of growth. Um, but as we, obviously, as we, you know, as we keep ramping up, they become more and more critical, particularly in our relationship with advertisers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so because as much as we, you know, care about programmatic advertising, we're in the end, we're also going to have to go out there and sell and sell ourselves to advertisers uh, on a customized basis. So mm -hmm. um, the story we have to tell based on the numbers that are showing up are, is critical. Yeah. Uh, so you said you have your own analytics. Do you have anything like that you guys uh, developed and implemented in your platform and that's how you kind of get the data or use a third party? No, we use third party stuff. Third party. Um, but um, uh, there's some analytic, there's some, there's some elements of what we're doing that I think we'd like to have analytics for that we don't. And so we're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, you know, we haven't yet, but we will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to AVOD, so what revenue shares are we talking about? Uh, with who? With the was uh, like with was like advertisers. Uh, you know, we're well. We don't we don't share revenue with advertisers. We share revenue with our. I mean, yeah, friends. yeah, right. Uh, right. Uh, but you know, yeah, sixty forty seventy thirty. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we're we're flexible depending mm -hmm. on. Uh, um, on who it is, but uh, it, it sort of breaks down into those general, as it does generally from across the industry in most, in most industries, mm -hmm. it sort of winds up somewhere around there. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then maybe, um, Aaron, maybe you can touch base a little bit on SVOD. If we're talking about SVOD generally, so for some, for some partners, for some content owners, it's still the really, really good method of monetization. I think if it comes to like, uh, maybe fitness or educational content, maybe SVOD is still the option. Um, if that is the case, what do you think price would depend on? Like how they come up with the idea of what would the subscription would be the month yeah. or year? So um, in my experience at digital media rights, at least we, uh, you know, I manage our advertising business and uh, product, but we um, we also do have a subscription option, uh, watch without ads option that also unlocks a very limited selection mm -hmm. of additional premium content that's behind a paywall. And if you want to compare the uh, value of a user who's subscribed versus a value of a user who's watching with, free with ads, it would take, I mean, at a normal CPM rate, it would take like anywhere from 500 to a thousand if you're if you're at a really high cpm maybe a few hundred ad impressions from that user to even come anywhere close to the amount of value you're getting from a subscriber plus a subscribe a subscription is a much cleaner uh just transaction in that you the it's there's a of course there's expenses to process the payment you're paying out royalties to your content providers but there's fewer there's no ad server involved. There's no advertiser who uh, needs a cut, perhaps, of uh, some sort of additional serving fee. Sometimes there's multiple serving fees involved, depending on the technology you're using. So uh, the price point for subscription, you want to keep it low, I think, because how, how else are you going to acquire uh, users, especially if you're an independent or a smaller company as compared to the to the Netflixes, etc. Uh, you can't make it so low that you're not able to pay out your uh, royalties uh, mm -hmm. or, or your uh, your uh, or just you know recoup on on uh, the fees related to the technology you're you're putting in and the uh, etc. I'd say that uh, th there's there's just sort of standard price price points uh ser premium services seem to go up and beyond a six dollar mark but five dollars is a pretty common standard subscription cost 
even that steep for someone who's got their Hulu, HBO Max, Amazon Prime, Netflix, et cetera. And uh, that's why we're comfortable in the hybrid space. It doesn't, uh, you know, having both things as options prevents us from devaluing one side of the business or the other. I, I sort of see it as a, um, if we, if subscription grows, it's not necessarily going to eat into our advertising business. And mm -hmm. if it does, that's going to improve the bottom line. So worst case, you, you know, and pe people who, uh, we give, we give our, our, our users the choice and we, we've got a uh, modest but sufficient uh, subscription fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think one of the, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 go ahead. I, I think one of the ways to look at it is that, or, or at least one of the possibilities is that as people develop, is to, for something to start on an AVOD platform and as people develop relationships with characters or ideas or, or, or content, um, it could certainly migrate over to a, you know, to a, uh, behind a paywall. Um, you know, it, it's, you need to, for somebody to write a check, they need to have a relationship with the content. Um, you know, just as in, you know, journalism, just like Substack or something, you know, it, it's people will pay a certain amount of money for to read a writer that they care about, you know, but um, so it's certainly possible that um, as, as content develops on a, on an AVOD platform, it could then migrate over to an SVOD platform. You know, if you have a, you know, I could certainly see a show that, you know, all of a sudden people love and it's developing, you know, relationships with an audience and there's merchandising. So it's like merchandising, you know, some shows mm -hmm. in the kids business, uh, sh you know, characters become popular and all of a sudden there are dolls that are created of them and they're sold in Walmart, you know, or, or personnel. When something gets to that point, people are willing to pay additional money for their kids to enjoy those products. And when that happens, it's an indication that something could perhaps survive behind a paywall and that people would pay money for it. Um, where we are and where we're starting from, that's not the case. We're starting really from scratch. Uh, but as our content grows and stuff like that, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it does succeed in that level, that we'd certainly create an option for uh, additional uh, ways to interact with that content behind a paywall. Yeah. It's all again about branding and like relationship, right? Like you said, between uh, audience and the brand. Or character. Completely. Yeah, thank you. Also, Dean, um, I wanted to cover another topic, which is really important for after, you know, once you have your channel, once you pick the model that you would like to implement. Uh, so I guess promotion is the next step for all that. Um, what do you do to market your channels? Well, um, we're, we're not, at the, you know, if we had infinite resources, we would do infinite marketing on infinite platforms because uh, you can't have enough promotion in this environment where you're competing mm -hmm. with, uh, with everything else. I mean, we yeah. don't. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so right now we're, uh, we're doing some promotion with Roku, some, you know, cross promotion. We're doing cross promotion with some of our uh, content owners. You know, they'll put, uh, uh, you know, they'll point people to the content on various other platforms. Um, and uh, we're about to start uh, in about three weeks from now, we're going to start doing a uh, promotional effort with influencers in the children's uh, space, moms, mostly, um, you know, um, and uh, reach out to some of those bloggers and, and uh, 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 as well. So, uh, and then there's organic, you know, just organic promotion, but um you know, ultimately, we're going to need to we're going to need to raise money and, and promote the stuff on various other on various other platforms. Um, what about social media? Is that the big part of your promotion, or not yet? I, I don't. With the children's business, social media has limitations. Um, you know, who is it you're trying mm -hmm. to? Who is it? You know, it's it's probably the exact audience that is not right for the kids' business. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> the the the, the uh, you know, we're really trying to reach you know moms and kids. Uh, those are the two main decision makers in the children's space, you know, and that social media is probably not where you're going to find them, you know, my, moms marginally. So probably that's probably a later down mm -hmm. the road kind of thing. Uh, so, um, no. Um, and you, you mentioned that you're doing some buys with Roku. Uh, are you using Roku self-serve? Is that what it is? Uh, yeah. 
how what's your experience with them i don't i'm not i'm not sure what the metrics are i mean i have to my partner who's the the is the ad uh, is the ad guy between i'm the content guy he's the ad guy but uh so i'm not sure what the metrics are but uh, i think it's been uh, i think it's been pretty um uh, pretty positive from what i understand uh and we're, mm -hmm. we're certainly seeing some we see an uptick in in uh viewers when we do the promotions so uh they are effective Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of best practices, maybe just related to kids' content of sustaining install growth, what are they? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. Advice. So, what would be your advice on sustaining install, sustaining install growth, even if it comes to only kids' content, its channel, uh, kids' channels? Um, well, you know, uh, I'm not sure the answer to that yet. Uh, uh, we, it, we haven't been around long enough for me to really have data that supports any kind of particular strategy one way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I, I'd feel, uh, I feel like I was just talking off, you know, I threw my hat in mm -hmm. talking about that. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, what you're putting in front of the consumer, you know, I mean, that's what maintains install growth, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. so that's what we're going to focus on. Yeah. I feel like uh, branding, like number one, would be the best way to engage organic. And then on the top of that, you kind of can play around different. Well, brand, uh, right. It's true. Well, brand, brand is a, you know, brand is a, again, I, I, like I said, I always look for what's underneath. A brand is really a, uh, a contract between you and the viewer that keeps getting renewed every time you show them a piece of content or, or are in front mm -hmm. of them, you know? Mm -hmm. And and you have to keep delivering on that. Whatever the promise is inherent in that, you know, in that you have to keep delivering on it. Disney, Disney's a brand because for you know decades it delivered quality family content to mm -hmm. to you know to American, you know, to global audiences. You know, so what we are and and what we promise our kids and the parents who are watching, that is the core of the brand. And so for that to, and but for that to build, it takes time. It's it's not just a repetition of a name, you know, it's, if that were all that a brand was, it would be, then it just, you apply dollars to it, but it's not, it's the, it's the relationship that you're building with the audience. And then the dollars on top of that, you know, to, to amplify that the dollars are yeah. a mode of amplification, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. hundred percent. I agree with you, Dean, on branding. That's very, very important because you got to stand out, not, but just running social media, but also, have a brand and then on the top of that like if you want your merchandising that's another way to grow and be recognizable for well, sure merch merchandise happens because there's a brand you know so yes it's like, exactly um, it, it, that's what allows you to transfer from you know one platform to another platform to a store to a to a movie to a you know it's it's that it's it's that relationship that you've built with the consumer in, in the kids space i mean there may be other considerations in more adult spaces but that, that's certainly in the, in the children's family business yeah. Okay. Aaron, any uh, best practices on sustaining and stealth growth? Maybe you could cover more categories if that matter. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to hear that from, from something from your experience as well. Yeah, I think for us, at least, well, install growth is, uh, needs to be balanced with user retention, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, so content refresh, having uh, continually having new content and also having content at the surface at the top of the of your application that's interesting to users. Uh, we've been experimenting with uh, having a linear feed that auto plays, which can be pretty sticky and and uh, you know interesting for for users. Basic, uh, of course, branding. Uh, part of install growth is, I mean, of course, it requires the effort the marketing efforts on your part to get it in people's faces to have the branding accessible to people but there's mm -hmm. also an element of gaining momentum that causes your app to be placed highly in search results that's separate even from the marketing i mean you can pay to have your app come up higher in search results or on the sort of global list of channels on a given platform but uh, with time and with the development of of your user base and through some secret black box algorithm, you'll end up coming up higher up if a keyword is searched on, on mm -hmm. uh, Roku, for instance. I mean, th there's, um, 
there's probably some nuanced algorithm that determines that, or it's just related to rank and, and, and keyword searching. Regardless, it snowballs uh, like a lot of these things do. And, uh, but you know, if you're looking at proportional growth to your existing user base, then uh, it's definitely easier to pick up the momentum at the beginning it takes fewer to really make the difference and you start to see the results quickly, especially if you're looking at the, um, your channel's global rank, the amount of revenue you're bringing in. If it's a subscription-based platform, the number of subscribers you have. Of course, if it's an advertising-based platform, there's a plethora of other metrics that you could be looking at. Uh, there's also sort of the, the, the other side of like uh, geo-based focus, you know, you, you, you different uh, user locations have different values to to uh, to you so on an advertising level um, sometimes demographically if there's a demographic involved in your content for instance mm -hmm. digital media rights has uh, a couple of Korea set Korean centric brands uh, for Koreans abroad and sometimes your focus has to be, pointed at a place where there's a lot of uh, people in that particular language group or ethnic group, or, uh, what have you. Uh, and sometimes that also coincides with the advertising considerations. Uh, so, uh, and you, you want your app to work also, you know, that there's sometimes you'll have, I mean, like Dean was saying, technical issues with your application, even at launch, post launch, et cetera. Um, and you don't want to lose, you don't want to have people bounce out after clicking in. Um, you want to sustain, you want to have sustained user engagement. And uh, if, you're, if you're seeing, uh, you know, X number of installs a month, but the same number uh, bounce out, it's, that's like 100% churn. You're, you're not going to get, you're not going to develop. You're not, that's not, uh, that's not really growth, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, I really interesting the that you mentioned the keyword um, a combination, right? That kind of lets you uh, pop up in the maybe like at the first line in Roku. Uh, did anything that you guys did to like did any feature promotions or anything with keywords as well, just to make sure you know you kind of pop up on Roku more than anybody else. Uh, no, we haven't yet, but we will. I mean, as I said, we're still we're still at a pretty early stage, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to mm -hmm. right now for us to be spending money on that. Once once we launch, you know, we I guess we kind of feel we're going to be a completely who we want to be once we sort of launch our, you know, kind of linear. As Aaron was saying, I, we we've always believed that the key to stickiness for kids was was to launch a linear uh, a linear channel with content with actual content that was meaningful. Uh, once we do that, which we're casting for now, and we're going to go into production sometime in the next month or two, uh, mm -hmm. then I think we're going to feel like we're completely who we want to be, and we're, we've built we've built what we want to build, and now we can mm -hmm. tell people about it, and, and meaning market it. Um, until we do that, I think all all of our you know efforts are going to be you know kind of quiet and you know uh, uh, laid back and you know uh, um, you know and and uh, and low cost. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. It was very, very informative and interesting. And I feel like uh, it would be even interested to re reconnect again. Uh, and, you know, even in six months, and I feel like there is so much more to change and it's going to be so many more best practices on, on marketing or in development. And uh, in fact, industry is, really shifting and growing uh, really, really fast. So a couple takeaways for me that I noticed, I feel like um, even we know we have a sturdy growth, we st like CTV is still in kind of a premature phase when it comes to marketing uh, or even the monetization, you know, picking the monetization uh, strategy here. So I think there is a lot of things is going to be happening and changing over the course of the next six months. Uh, also, it's still kind of a, a young development area, uh, and there is a lot of uh, promising interactive ad formats to come. 
And uh, so regarding the development, I think, guys, uh, I totally agree with you that it's very, very smart and um, it's going to it's going to give us better outcomes and results if we engage third party companies with the development, because the goal here is really to launch the brand and grow your brand and not just have whatever content out there, but truly um, have a a lot of things combined when it comes to marketing it's going to be brand marketing it's going to be paid media marketing it's going to be a keyword and almost like seo marketing so there is a combination of things that's going to help us grow here um anything else you guys would want to add any recommendations or any tips on how to really be a savvy in the ott and ctv space I wouldn't presume to tell anybody, uh, you know, we, we, we've learned mostly by stubbing our toe and, uh, I, I think we'll just kind of keep moving forward that way. Um, you know, it's, it's it, the, the, the good and the bad of it is that it's such a young industry it's such an early point of information mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, uh, to quote William Goldman, a great Hollywood screenwriter and nobody knows nothing. Um, and, uh, uh, so at least on the, at least on the meta side, obviously there's people like Aaron who seem to know a lot. So, but, um, you know, we're, we're still, we're still kind of figuring it out, um, as we go. And that's one of the exciting things about it. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that it's, it's good to be experimental trial and error, uh, not shying away from opportunities that are of sort of uncertain, uh, like possibility, uh, that it's not, there's, there's always going to be things that don't work out in a, in a new and evolving space like this. But with the amount of new platform launches going on, the amount of new channel launches, the fact that channels or apps are now also sort of platforms in and of themselves, it's uh, if people aren't trying new things, dipping their, um, you know, dipping their toes in all different types of opportunities, then they're going to get le sort of left behind uh, as, <laughs> as, as it tends to happen. Uh, so it's, it, it takes an experimental approach, I think, uh, and open-mindedness, uh, but also being careful with uh, allocation of resources, especially for independence. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you guys so much for your time. It was pleasure talking to you and hearing your feedback and uh, experience in the space. And yeah, it took us about an hour, just like we planned. So I think it's great. Thank you very much, guys. I really Thank appreciate you. your time. Have a great Thank day you. ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank yeah, you. we're going to share the, the recording with you after, after all. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Dean.